see those things? Do you know what they are? They're pretty sharp and pokey, right? You get to experience them when you go to the dental office. Well, I figured that would be a good illustration to introduce our topic um, this morning. Just a little story about that. At a dental office where Jane worked, uh, there was a hygienist that was being interviewed uh, as a, to be added to the staff. And when she found out how long Jane had been uh, doing dental hygiene, she asked her the question, how have you managed to work this long? I don't know how long ago it was, maybe Jane remembers, but uh, in any case, uh, Jane's response was, I keep my tools sharp. And there's a reason for that, not to make people bleed, but it's a lot more efficient, it's easier on Jane's hands, and it's more effective, they get in and out of the doctor's office much quicker. And so I've kind of borrowed her answer um, to, to um, ask a question that's unrelated except to, take, to borrow this idea to, that Jane gave to keep her instrument sharp. So if I can rephrase the topic, rephrase the question with that in mind, how can we be effective in our mission of making Jesus felt? And we can answer much as Jane answered, and that is to keep our instruments sharp. Well, that doesn't give it away, but our text, if we look at the text and the context, it tells us what this, the uh, tools are. And if you move back, if you're still in Mark 1, I want to draw your attention to uh, verse 35, which preceded this encounter with the man with leprosy. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Then Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everybody's looking for you. Well, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So, I, so he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So our text um, lets us know that prayer was a part of Jesus' ministry. I'd like to suggest to you that they, that may not only have been essential for him, but perhaps even the most important part, his most important tool, if you please. People didn't see Jesus pray, but they benefited from his prayers, not merely because they may have been the object of his prayers, but Jesus, we don't have recorded, we have recorded the one in John 17, and we have the one where Jesus taught his disciples to pray. But what do you think Jesus prayed about? We know that Jesus took the garb of humanity and he had to learn the scriptures at his mother's knee. So when I was at the seminary, they had a term to describe this, to describe Jesus' nature, his divine nature. He was fully God and fully man, but his deity was quiescent. In other words, he, he had to receive directions at the hand of his father. He didn't just get out of bed and say, I know where I'm going. He had to do it just like you and I do. We bow down before God. We offer our praise and our thanksgiving. We confess our dependency upon him. We ask him to prepare us for what lies ahead, uh, the people who we contact with, who we come in contact with. We may pray for certain individuals we have a burden for. And Jesus was just as dependent. In fact, he, is, he was probably more dependent upon the Father than we are. And the reason for that is not because we don't need it, it's because we're more negligent than he is. And so, the first tool that we need to keep sharp is, that, is the need for us to pray. And if it was important for Jesus to pray, how much more necessary is it for us? Do we need God, God's guidance to reach out to those divine appointments? Do we need wisdom to know how to connect with these individuals? Do we need grace to rise above the enemy's distractions, to attempt to create conflicts, discouragement, or whatever the enemy would like to put in our way to interfere with God's mission? 
And so prayer is not merely important, it is essential. In John chapter 15, verses 7 and 8, Jesus changes the metaphor, and you're familiar, I'm sure, with that passage because it's where Jesus was, he changed the metaphor to where the Father is the gardener, and it goes on to say, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So the Father is the gardener, Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. We have to maintain the connection, and that's what Jesus was teaching in this section, particularly in verse 7 and 8. He said, if you remain in me, that's what praying is, remaining in Jesus. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is what we read, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. So our prayer life has a relationship to bearing fruit. No praying, no fruit. The second tool, yeah, I'm getting behind here. There you go. So we've looked at those two. Um, The next uh, step is back to our scripture reading in Mark chapter 1, verses 38 and 39. And in there we read, um, here we go, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So repeating the the, um, the idea, no intimacy with the Father, no fruitfulness. No contact with people, no fruitfulness. So we have to be engaging people. And Donna talked about her experience at home with this prospective uh, student. Uh, she's had divine guidance, and if each of you had your story to tell, and if we listened to it, you would have a different story, but essentially the same thing, where God brings us into contact with people. Um, So we have to have contact, not only with the Father, but with people. Okay, this thing is supposed to advance it. Hello, there. And here's a statement from Ministry of Healing, page 143, reinforcing that idea. There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing, and we've inserted the words or phrase using the words of the gospel, and more time were spent in personal ministry, the music of the gospel, greater results would be seen. Now these parenthetical uh, enclosures are not part of the text, but I would just like to ask you what you thought sermonizing was. Is what people do when they stand in a pulpit sermonizing? I hope you don't answer yes, because I looked in the dictionary and I found um, what that was. See if I can find it. Um, Where did it go? Well, it doesn't show up, but I'm going to make an effort. Sermonizing means expressing opinionated ideas, coercing somebody to think like us. That's sermonizing. Preaching sermons is uplifting Christ, and if he's lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. So there's a big gap between sermonizing and truly preaching. Jesus preached the word, and he revealed the Father, and if the Father is revealed as he really is, he will draw people to himself. Okay, coming in contact with people. I had an experience on a, a flight Um, when we were coming back from Texas after one of our visits to our son and daughter-in-law, their two children, the guy that I sat next to was a little bit younger than I, and he had been drafted into the Vietnam conflict. And as as I listened to his story about all the danger and battles that he was involved in, I asked him how he recovered from all the trauma. The question opened a floodgate where tears just poured down his cheeks. He did 95% of the talking and I did 95% of the listening. 
And in the course of his story, he confessed his loss of faith over the terrible things that he saw. When I had opportunity, I confessed my faith in, in a God of love who is passionate about his lost children and those who experience abuse, injustice, and loss. I confess that I believe that the God of the earth will do what is right. God will ultimately, if he doesn't do it in this life, he will ultimately wipe away all tears. So we can be assured of that to those who trust him. He mentioned the rapture, and some enterprising Adventist might take advantage of the opportunity. And I'm not saying it's inappropriate for us to talk about the second coming of Jesus or the Sabbath or any of the particulars that we have. But in this case, it seemed like it, it was a distraction for me to respond to the rapture because his understanding of what the rapture is wasn't what I believe the scripture says. So it seems like instead of responding to his felt needs, which was this trauma that he experienced, and he needed to have healing of that, and um, I was praying that the Lord would reveal to him, to him what he needed so that he could find some healing from that experience. I remember one time I was in college, uh, one Sabbath afternoon, we went to San Francisco, and we were supposed to do some street witnessing. Well, that was kind of new and different to me. I think I was a senior. I had canvassed some. So it was, you know, canvassing, you knock on a door, and you have a speech you give, and interacting with other people who didn't send a request in, and, um, you know, it was a little bit different. Anyway, he expressed to me, after he found out I was... Um, a Christian, he um, said that he wished that all Christians would go back to Ohio, where he was from. He came to California to have a good time. And uh, I could, I understood what he was saying. And I, I felt like, you know, I was kind of in a position where I was buttonholing him. I was, you know, I didn't have the words to say, but uh, I saw that it, you know, I wasn't welcome. <laughs> well, I remember the tables were turned. And uh, <clears throat> a number of years later, I was, I think, in, I was in Phoenix because I was, I could still run back then. And so I was doing my two or three miles, three or four miles, whatever it was. And I remember it was a Sunday morning. There was a church that I was running by. This is my pattern that I did um, every, every day. And so Sunday, there were a lot of people in the parking lot a lot of cars, and I noticed that as I came close to the church that one of the people who got out of the car and was going to the church came back to his car and reached into the car and got out a pamphlet. I thought to myself, I know where this is going. I'm going to get buttonholed. He didn't engage me. He was uh, using a hammer and a, 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 a nail set to make his point, and uh, when, when I didn't accept it, he, he said something like, uh, oh, what did he tell me? Um, uh, oh, here we go. So I didn't grab it, and so he shouted at me, asking him if, if I knew Christ. And I assured him that I did. And uh, he asked me what church I went to. And I called back that I, respond, I responded to him, the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he groaned. So you know where he was coming from. He perceived Adventists as legalists and uh, anything that any person who was, had beliefs different from his must be wrong. Well, we talked about the prophets, and I was going to mention one of them this morning. Jonah is um, uh, the Jonah model. And, you know, he ran away, and then he came back, and he proclaimed the message that he had been given. And I'm not diminishing the importance of the prophets. I mean, they are biblical. God has sent them. But I'm not a prophet. Sister White says Christ's 
method alone will give true success in reaching the people. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, then he bade them, follow me. On the same page, she wrote, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not and cannot be without fruit. Well, you know, Jesus was accused of many things. One of the things that he was accused of that he didn't deny was that he was a friend of sinners, right? And Jesus didn't deny that. So he must have been accepting that as a definition of what he was about, a friend of sinners. In fact, you remember, and I've, I've mentioned it uh, <clears throat> before, but I'll mention it again because it's so powerful. In Steps to Christ, page 46, she writes, uh, the world's redeemer accepts men as they are. He will not only grant, he accepts men as they are in spite of their wants, their imperfections, and their weaknesses. He will grant, he will grant, he will uh, give forgiveness of sin and grant redemption through his blood. Or it says not only will he grant or forgive sins and grant redemption through his blood, but he will satisfy the deepest longings of the heart to those who wear his yoke and bear his burden. So in our engagement with people, in Jesus' engagement with people, before they even responded to the invitation to follow him, he accepted them as they are. And we can go through a litany of people who have problems. Uh, what about the homosexual? Would Jesus accept him as he is? Well, by all means, how is he going to reach him if he doesn't accept him? That doesn't mean he's forcing salvation on that individual. He's just recognizing him, recognizing him as a person of value. And we could go on and list a lot of other uh, failures that people are experiencing in life. But Jesus accepts us. Praise God that he does that. But he, we don't remain the same. When he accepts us, we're transformed. We want to have a relationship with him. And in the process of that relationship, we're going to embrace the need to change and realize that he is the one who can change us. Well, the third tool... Moving on, oh, this is going too fast. Did I leave something out? I did leave something out. Well, I'll have to tell you about it. <clears throat> One of the most important words in my mind in the New Testament is the word compassion. And I like it so well because it describes how I think I need to be toward people, to have compassion for them. Not to ramrod Christianity or Adventism down their throat, but to have compassion for them where they are. Um, I'm sure you're not interested in the Greek word, but for those who might, splagsnizomai, it's just a, it's a, really a guttural, almost a German word. <laughs> splagsnizomai, it means to have compassion. It's mentioned a number of times in the New Testament. And we came to this guy who was leprous, it says he was filled with compassion and he reached out and touched this man. In response to his question about healing, he said, I am. I'm willing to heal you, be clean. And it immediately left him. So if there were, I, I, what shall I say? You can hide slides and I must have hidden this slide. So it's too late to do anything about it, but Anyway, that's one of the tools that we need to keep sharp. And we need to keep asking ourselves, how am I interacting with people? Do they feel that I have compassion for them? Or am I a project? Or, I'm, or am I a number? You know, that I'm going to, this person's going to uh, put me on his list that he, he's gotten one more believer. And it's, it's all about them instead of Jesus. And and the needs of the people that he wants us to minister to. And so this word for compassion is used a number of times. It's mentioned in um, the healing of the 5,000, pardon me, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus had compassion upon these people. He saw them, and they didn't have any food. Uh, when he healed the blind men, he had compassion on them. When he raised the son of the widow of Nain, he had compassion on that family unit. And it was used when the father 
uh, welcomed the prodigal back. He had compassion upon him, and the son fell on his father's neck. Um, it's used to describe the uh, response of the Good Samaritan to the Jew who had been beaten and robbed. And of course, from our text, it's used to describe how Jesus felt toward this man who had leprosy. I wonder how Jesus came about to minister to this particular person or these individuals. In his prayer, don't you think there was some kind of connection <clears throat> between his praying and his ministry? So when he's praying that God would lead him, God led him to this situation. In fact, he impressed the leper because lepers weren't allowed to come in contact with other people. He impressed this leper to come into Jesus' presence. And he encouraged, the leper was encouraged by the healing of other people. Anybody who had asked for healing was healed. And so the, the Father, through the Holy Spirit, through the angels, I'm not sure how it happened, but he, he was impressed to see Jesus. Well, sometimes we benefit from those kind of things, and uh, Jesus has some words to say of caution. He cautioned this leper not to say anything to anybody, but go to the uh, synagogue with your offering and offer it as a, a thank offering for what has been done after they have pronounced you clean. And Jesus had reasons for saying that. And uh, this leper thought he was just being humble, that he didn't want to attract attention to himself. So, but he, he complied with Jesus' request. And before he got to the temple, he, just, he was focused on what he was supposed to do. So he did that. And the people who, who pronounced him um, who diagnosed him with leprosy were the same people who were still there and they had to examine him. And after the examination, they determined that he was not. He was freed from leprosy. And had Jesus not said what he did, the leper, by, by announcing who it was, would have prejudiced these guys because they were collaborating against Jesus. Their strategy was to get him out of their lives. And if they knew that Jesus had healed this man, they would have lied about the, the new diagnosis. So anyway, he eventually did let the cat out of the bag. And uh, consequently, Jesus' ministry was compromised, it says. Well, that's a little more than what I was planning on telling you. But uh, so the third tool is having compassion for people. In evangelism, page 646, is the following statement. The families who engage in the missionary work should come close to hearts. The spirit of Jesus should pervade the soul of the worker. It is the pleasant, sympathetic words, the manifestation of disinterested love for their souls that will break down the barriers of pride and selfishness and show to unbelievers that we have the love of Christ. And then the truth will find its way to the heart. This is our work and the fulfilling of God's plan. So don't you think that is grist for our prayer mill, that God would help us to be compassionate? Because it's not natural. I mean, we're fallen. It's not natural for us to be compassionate. Now, it's easy to be critical. And so we need to pray that the Lord will somehow create that compassion in our heart. And of course, that's, we receive that by beholding Jesus because he was the model for us, wasn't he? He acted compassionately to everybody. I think even perhaps in his, how do we want to put this, his scathing rebukes to the Pharisees, compassion drove him to say those things because that would be the only thing that would break through to their hearts. And I'm sure that Jesus must have prayed for these people who were plotting his death. Lord, how can I, how can I get through to them? So even if we have enemies, people who are trying to do us in, we need to pray that the Lord will equip us so that we will compassionately relate to them and win their confidence and minister to their needs. In Acts of the Apostles, page 31, we follow, find the following statement. The Savior knew that no argument, however logical, would melt hard hearts or break through the crust of worldliness and selfishness. He knew that his disciples must receive the heavenly endowment, that the gospel would be effective only as it was proclaimed by hearts made warm 
and lips made eloquent by a living knowledge of him who is the way, the truth, and the life. Just moving through quickly, I guess I'm going to give up on this uh, thing, making the presence of Jesus felt. It's not moving, but that, I guess I'll just put this aside. <clears throat> but I'd like to close with a story about a man that you may have heard, heard of. His name is Tony Campolo. How many have heard of Tony Campolo? A few of you, not everybody, but Tony Campolo's, uh, by vocation, he was an instructor. He was a teacher. He was a sociologist. And he was invited to come to uh, Honolulu to participate in some Christian uh, gathering. Well, there was a nine-hour difference between, I think it was either six or nine hours, I'm not sure which, but there was a time gap between where, where he lived and where he was in Honolulu. So he found himself awake at three o'clock in the morning. And so he wandered down to the um, restaurant, uh, cafe, maybe that was a better term for it, a cafe. And he ordered some food and he was eating that food. And uh, <clears throat> while he was there, there were a number of people they were all ladies. You can imagine where this story is going, right? <clears throat> they were all ladies of the night. So they popped in, they made their orders, they were uh, you know, eating. And uh, while they were there, this one girl, her name was Agnes, I think, she said that uh, her birthday was tomorrow. Well, one of the other hardened individuals was making some comment, oh, who cares if it's your birthday? Just kind of dismissing her and what do you want me to do make a cake for you so there was this give and take back and forth and you could tell that it wasn't a very pleasant experience so eventually they left and so Tony asked the uh, guy behind the counter um, he said you know what I think we need to do well first of all he asked her the question asking the question do these girls show up every night at three three o'clock yeah, every night. Here's what I think we need to do, Tony told him. We need to get a birthday cake and, uh, and decorate your uh, business uh, announcing happy birthday to Agnes. And when she comes in, we'll sing happy birthday to her and light the candles. So he got there at 2.30 and um, they actually had a conversation between himself and this guy who was uh, behind the counter and the guy behind the counter actually said, well, that's my job. I'm supposed to make the cake. So Tony consented to do that. And so they were there and they, you know, Tony got the place decorated up and uh, 15 minutes before Agnes was scheduled to be there, all the other girls showed up. So word was out on the street. All the girls in that profession showed up at this you know, cafe. So when three o'clock came, uh, Agnes showed up with her friend and she was blown away. She was blown away. All the signs, the cake, nobody had ever done this for her before. And she was just overwhelmed by what she saw. And uh, <clears throat> there was some conversation back and forth between the guy behind the, uh, in the back. Uh, he said, well, come on, Agnes, uh, blow the candles out. And she was just too overwhelmed by the experience. And so, Tony said, well, I'll do it. So he blew the candles out for her. And she kind of shuffled with words and didn't know what to say. And she was just overwhelmed. And finally, she said, came and blurted that out, that she would like to take this cake home. He said, fine, take the cake home. You know, <laughs> So she did. And anyway, the end of the story is that this, uh, when she was gone, Tony thought to himself, well, what shall I do? Well, let's pray. So with all these ladies of the night, uh, he invited them to bow their heads and pray. And so he prayed. And after the prayer, the guy that baked the cake was saying to uh, Tony, he says, well, what kind of preacher are you? And I said, well, I'm a preacher that uh, holds birthday parties for prostitutes. And he said, well, man, I could be a member of a church like that. And uh, the the cook, he, he uh, didn't think Tony was a preacher, and he wasn't. He was, just a, he was just a human being like the rest of us. So this is a rather unusual story, but it illustrates the point that 
Tony caught on. He accepts people as they are. That's the bridge that we create between ourselves and others who have such diverse values from us. Are they going to want to listen to us if they don't feel that we have a heart for them? What's going to happen when we have a heart for these people? They're going to open their heart. They're going to feel cared about. We're going to win their confidence. And we will win their trust. And we will earn the right to speak to them about Jesus. So I hope that as we continue our spiritual journey, that we will keep our tools sharp. That we will realize how important it is for us to pray. To pray about what we're supposed to do, who we're supposed to see, the attitude we're supposed to bear. And as we think about some of the distractions that may come our way, there may be people who are obtuse, who are gunning for us. Dear God, please give me grace to know how to respond. I don't come, come by nature to, to respond that way. But Jesus said we're to love our enemies, pray for those who despitefully use us. And as we pray, <clears throat> we will continue to realize how important prayer is because that's where we get equipped. And as we soak our hearts in the presence of Jesus through his word and through reading books like The Desire of Ages, that we will be transformed and that we will be equipped, that we will be, we will be able to make the presence of Jesus felt and we will be abundantly fruitful. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your paternal love <clears throat> that we have been the object of your affection, of your sacrifice, of your mercy and your grace. We're grateful that you're capable of completing this process that you've begun, that we're not gonna be left cold-hearted, but that you will create that warmth, that compassion within our hearts. That we'll reach out to people regardless of where we find them, what they're doing. And we pray that people will even accuse us of being friends of sinners so that your purposes can be accomplished through us as we make the presence of Jesus felt. Help us to keep our tools sharp, not that we're depending on them, but we're depending on you. And we know how important prayer is. We know how important compassion is. We know how important it is to come in contact with people. We pray that you will use us, prepare us, transform us, and make us useful in your plan, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.